Please welcome uh, Pastor Peter Tanji.
check that your children have Jesus or do they have religion? 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 12 to 13 tells us, In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I told him I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and did not rebuke them. God made the father responsible. Parents, you are responsible. The Bible says, I'm going to judge Eli. I'm going to judge his house. And First Chronicles tells us eventually what happened. Eli and his family line lost the privilege of being priests. God judged the father for the behavior of the children. Think about it. Parents, if I can convey to you one important message, you may delegate, but you cannot abdicate. You are the parents. You are responsible for your children. I do not know why many people are copying the model of the West. They send their children abroad when they finish high school. You know, there's nothing wrong, but I'm going to ask you, why are you sending your children away from you when they are at their most critical years in their adult life? Think about it. Why do you send your children to college away from you when in college they are going to make the most important decisions of their lives? Career. Who will I marry? All of their value system will be tested. And yet I've seen this again and again. Many parents are very sincere. They want better education for their children. They send them abroad. Well, you can send them abroad, but I want to remind you, you are responsible. So, think about what I'm saying. Your children will leave you sooner or later. They will really leave you. But don't be in a hurry to send them out. It is a big high jacket. Don't be in a hurry to send them to the States, or to Canada, or to Australia, or to New Zealand. But, it's okay if you, if you do it, but I'm just telling you my experience. We had thousands of families in Sicilia, and I've seen what happened. I just, talked, I just talked to one father last week. How is your family? You know, Use the father used to say, excellent, excellent, because the, his son went to the States. And then the son got married. How's your family? Excellent. But you know what's shocking? Last Sunday, uh, last, last week, last Wednesday, he said, that's so good. Why? His grandchildren are no longer walking with Jesus. His grandchildren have turned away from the Lord. Just think, a successful father, if you ask me, is not counted just because your children are obeying the Lord. I want to say, what happened, what's happened to your children's children? Are they still walking with the Lord? So today, it's a simple inspiration. Everybody say that. Disciple your family. You got to disciple your family. Do not let Faith Academy take your place. Do not let the church take your place. Our brother talked about don't, don't abdicate. You may delegate, but don't let the school take over. You. And that's why I look at this side, all, all mothers. Where are the fathers? You see? Yes. 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 Anyway, before I begin, I'd like you to meet my family. My wife and I, we have five wonderful children. You will notice they are all handsome and beautiful because they are after the mother. Okay? I told them, honey, you were not listening. I introduced myself here saying all of them studied and graduated here and I thank God for faith and courage. You see, I submit to my wife. Gentlemen, you learn to listen. Next, they are all happily married. They're all happily married. By the grace of God, they are all serving the Lord. They all have small groups. 
，他们队友小组，他们在教会很很热情的侍奉。And they obey the Bible. You know why they obey the Bible? The Bible says go and multiply. So, <laughs> 我有二十二个孙子。And by the grace of God, we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary two months ago. So, it's my privilege to share with you the mistakes I have made, what we did right, what we did wrong. So, I want to share with you parenting because it is something close to the heart of God. You cannot change your ancestors, but you can influence your disciples. Discipleship begins at home. I tell pastors, if your family is not in order, what makes you think you'll be effective in pastoring a church? You see, family is crucial. So, if you ask me, what chapter in the Bible is the best for parenting? I submit to you Deuteronomy chapter 6. It is the best chapter on discipleship, the best chapter on parenting. Let's read it together. Let's begin together. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe. So the Bible, Moses, is now telling the people God is telling me to teach you the laws and the commands. Why is this so important? Look at the next verse. So that, everybody read, so that you, your children, and their children may fear the Lord, your God, as long as you Live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. The purpose of God for you and I to teach our children and their children's children so that they will be blessed. The Chinese love long life. Long life. But don't miss the next verse. Why do you teach them about the word of God, the commandments of God, everybody read. Hear, O Israel, obey so that, everybody read, so that it may go well with you. Until your children believe that obeying God will bless them, they will not like to obey God. You know why? Because they think God gives us commandments to control us, to restrict us, no, no, no. God gives us commandments to protect you, to make your children enjoy the meaning of what is real life. For example, my children, my grandchildren, and my son, they love to play basketball. In basketball, how many of you play basketball? Play Chinese football, soccer? Chinese <laughs> So what is your sport? Or study? Study, study. <laughs> anyway, you, you know sports, right? Sports, basketball, football, soccer, baseball, volleyball. Every sport has rules. Why do you need rules? You cannot enjoy a game without rules. Imagine basketball. I can hold the goal. And then I'll, I'll grab the ball. And then I run. And then you cannot touch me. I mean, it's, it's going to be a mess. The same thing with life. God gives us rules in marriage. God gives us rules in terms of moral purity. There are rules. Why? To enjoy life. Until your children know these are not rules for the sake of rules. These are God's rules because He loves us. Your children will not appreciate the Bible. So you need to learn how to teach. That's why the next verse is important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord our God. Everybody read, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. These words which I'm commanding you today 
shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently, your children. Talk of them when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, and when you rise up. In short, what is the first thing you must teach your children? You must love the Lord your God. Everybody read? With all. Now let me ask you, why all? I want to ask all of you ladies. I, I'm assuming you are all married, right? All of you are married, raise your hands. Jeffen or cheese or Jeffen? Now, listen. Have your Jeffen each other. Before you got married, your husband to be, your boyfriend, asked you, honey, will you marry me? And then before you can say yes, your boyfriend, your husband to be says, ah, before you say yes, I want you to listen. I love you with 99% of my heart. Then you say, why 99%? Why, why? And then your boyfriend says, because I, my old classmate, my old classmate is really my best friend. She's really good. But you are better. I really love you. Will you allow me once a month we will have coffee in Starbucks. No kissing, no holding hands. Just talking because one person, you know, I, I still love her one person, but I love you 99%. Will you marry me? What would you say? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Gentlemen, if your, if your wife tells you, honey, before I say yes to you, gentlemen, your wife says, I have a gym teacher, my classmate. I love you 99%. One person for a gym teacher. We go to Starbucks. We will have coffee once a month. No kissing, no hugging, no sex. Gentlemen, would you say okay? Of course not. You know you're laughing. You know why you're laughing? Because you know love. Demands 100 percent. Now, what makes you think you can love God 90 percent? What makes you think that it's okay with God <coughs> if you and I don't love Him with all our heart? You yourself will not want a husband to love you 99 percent. You 100 percent. What do you think of God? You see, the very nature of love is 100%. Love is an amazing quality given by God. If I love God 100%, I will learn to love my wife 100%. If I love God 100%, my capacity to love is growing, not shrinking. But the first love is God. 100% loving God. The rest will follow. Question. How do you teach that to your children? What is it? Verse 6, this word to which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. You see, you cannot teach, you cannot give, you can teach, but you cannot really pass on something you do not possess. If you don't love God, I'm going to guarantee you something. Your children will not love God. They will copy you. So, what must you do? You teach them. So today, I'm going to share with you three important principles. How do you influence your children? Three simple principles. It is called MRI. MRI. If you go to the hospital, you know what's MRI, right? Magnetic resonance imaging. It looks at the heart, right? It looks at the internal organ. Now, gentlemen, spiritually, you want to impact the heart of your children. You follow these three important principles. M R I M stands for what? Modeling. R stands for relationship, and I stands for intentionality. Because I'm only given one hour, according to your uh, boss, I follow. But actually, these principles are in a book. It's called Motivate. These are. Eight principles 
that I have condensed to just three. All right? Now, this book is unique. You know why? So that you will understand the principles. What's motivate? Motivate is you deal with the heart. M stands for what? Modeling. O stands for what? Open communication. T stands for what? Time. I, intimacy, relationship. V, vision. A, affirmation. Watch your time carefully. T, teach and train. And lastly, most important, trust them to God. However, because of time, I'm going to just give you three principles that will summarize some of those points, okay? Why is this book unique? It's Bible-based. Number two, my wife and I waited for 40 years. We did not write this book until we waited for 40 years. You know why 40 years? I wanted to see how my children will turn out. I wanted to see how the Bible will impact their life. And then this book is unique because my wife wrote this also, I wrote this, and our children, they all contributed to this book. And our grandchildren also contributed to this book. So it's unique. But it works, not just in our family, in our church. This book is now translated to Indonesian language, Chinese language, uh, not our expense. The people heard it, they said, can we translate, can we translate? I said, no problem. I think Italian also. All I'm saying is this. These are Bible based. So I'm going to share with you simple principles. How do you impact your children? Remember our last speaker, he says culture shock. The, the reality is this. Many children, when they reach college, 90, almost 70% do not go back to church in the States. I don't care what culture you are talking about. Americans themselves, when their children go to college, 70% will not go back to church. Why? If you ask me, parenting. Most pastors don't teach the parents how to disciple their own children. And most pastors have problems with their own children. In our ministry, we are very focused on helping our pastors succeed in parenting. If they have problems with their children, we give them all the time they need. We will help them. But parenting is so crucial. So are you ready for the three principles? What's principle number one? Modeling. Principle number two? All right, let's go to principle number one. Modeling. Everybody read. Children? Kabias. You don't have to tell them to copy you. They will copy you. Positively or negatively. Alright. I want to test you. Are you listening to me? Oh, please stand up. Touch it, right? Touch it. Are you listening to me? Yes. Your forefinger and your thumb. Okay, make a circle. Okay, make a circle. Touch it. You might think what? Watch out, yeah? Hey, okay. Yo, yo, okay? Alright. This circle, I want you to put it, are you listening? Put it in your chin, okay? Put it in your chin. I said chin. Why did you put it here? Why did you put it here? Because you copy. You see children copy. They don't listen. Your children copy you. They don't listen. Sit down. Okay, so that's my point. So children will copy us. So, I want to ask you. Modeling is not about perfection. What's your name? Modeling is being authentic. Modeling is being humble. When you make a mistake, you ask for forgiveness. It's not being perfect. No one is perfect. Our family is not perfect. I'm not perfect. But when we make mistakes, we acknowledge. Example, years ago, I was not polite 
to my wife. My wife uh, asked a question and I, I did not answer her politely. I was irritated. Gentlemen, do you have that experience where you answer your wife? No, not so politely. So, my daughter, after dinner, said, Daddy, can I walk with you? Now, in our family, we have a culture. We are open. We talk with each other. So she put her arms around me, Daddy, as we were walking. I was so nervous. You know, I, I knew. I knew why she wanted to walk with me. So she put her arms around me. She said, Daddy, the way you talk to mommy is not nice. Now, I was tempted to explain. I was tempted to defend. But I suggest, all of you, just keep quiet. When you are corrected, be humble. Don't defend. Just, just be quiet. So after walking, we went to the house and I called the United Nations. I, I called all my children and my wife and I said, Honey, will you forgive me? I ask for forgiveness. You see, in our family today, our culture is, you ask for forgiveness. You be authentic. You see, modeling is very crucial. It is not what you say, it's what you do. I want you to see a video of my daughter that explains the power of modeling. Let's hear it. She's my eldest daughter. A joy. What impacted me with my parents as well is that they were the best versions of themselves at home with us. Yes. And you know, I would see them up on the pulpit, especially my father. And when he would preach, I really believed in what he said, not just because it was from the Word of God, but because I saw that he lived the things that he talked about at home consistently. So that really blessed me. And I also have my own story. We were going to St. Luke's QC because my friend had asked for her father to be prayed over because he was very sick. So I convinced my dad. He was very busy. It was rush hour. I convinced him to go all the way to St. Luke's QC. And when we got there, it was the wrong hospital. <laughs> and I was so, so embarrassed. And I felt so a little bit nervous because I knew dad was so busy. But you know, he didn't react at all. He was so calm about it. He said, it's okay. If he's still went with me to St. Luke's BGC to pray with my friend's dad and share the gospel. You know, moments like that really impacted me. And this, it, I would say the same about my mom. She was just a consistently joyful person. Yeah, mom, ridiculously mom, joyful. Mom, mom, said, That's great. We have more time with each other. That's right. <laughs> she said that. Turn, that's right. So right you about mom, mom, we have more time with each other. So that's the kind of person she was, right? She would, she would respond positively to circumstances, even difficult situations. And, and so growing up, even though we were also homeschooled for a bit, I don't ever remember her yelling at us, getting really irritated with us. And you know, there have been times that I've struggled with that with my own children. And I remember my mom's example because I want my, my children to remember the same thing about me, that I choose to be a happy person. Not because of me, but because of the Lord. And because by God's grace, I saw that in my, in my mom. I also remember that my mom role modeled to me what it really means to be a, a submissive wife, a wife who honors her husband. And so I also remember that when I'm related to Edric and I'm struggling, right? I remember some weeks ago during the, during the quarantine, we were exercising as a family, and I didn't like the exercises that Edric was making us do, so I was challenging him. I was, I was saying, you know, I'm not going to do it that way. I'm going to do my own thing. That's but my fine. children, my children were watching. And so during the breakfast table afterwards, my oldest son said, you know, Mom, when you are contradictory towards Dad, when you challenge him in front of us, honestly, Mom, it makes me feel like I can do the same thing. So I really was convicted by that because... The truth is our kids are always watching us, and so the good things, the bad things, they will copy. So I really had to apologize and ask for his forgiveness. And I think Edward's going to close with that, the importance of, you know, modeling authenticity and humility to our children. Yeah, so the power in modeling is not just that it is something that we do more than what we say, but also when we mess up, we need to fess up, right? We like to say when we mess up, we fess up, meaning we humble ourselves to ask for forgiveness because we know that we want to model Christ's likeness and because we are imperfect, when we do mess up, we need to find a way to remedy that so that our children do not think we are hypocrites and instead they think we are authentic. And obviously, as we ask for forgiveness and desire to change, we need to show that we actually do the change. This is something we wanted to share from our hearts. So 
what's principle number one? Modeling. Praise God. Now, look at this quotation. You must be what you want your children to be because they will become what you are. You know, parenting requires a lot of hard work. And to me, the greatest challenge is modeling. Ladies, are you respectful of your husband? Gentlemen, how are you at home? Do you shout at your wife? How do you treat people? You see your children are watching you. And that's why I like you to ask the following questions today with your husband. Okay? Today, that's your assignment today. Number one, what do you and your spouse need to stop doing? Because it's a bad example. If you're always shouting with each other, if you're always criticizing people, that's a bad example. Number two, what should you start doing? Do they see that you love the Lord? You get excited to worship God on Sunday or do you go there late? In other words, what's your attitude towards God? Can they see you loving God? My wife and I are very intentional. We model what it means to love God on purpose. Because telling them to love God is nothing. They want to see. What should you continue doing? So, the first one, what should you and your spouse stop? I was teaching a couple, I said, stop fighting each other in front of your children. Stop shouting at each other. I said, stop criticizing other people, other Christians, in front of your children. Don't criticize others. You got a problem? Discuss privately. So, ask yourself, what's question number one? What do you and your spouse need to stop doing? So, gentlemen, you ask yourself, what should you change? Okay. Number two, what should you start doing? You see, parenting begins at home. Principle number two, your relationship. You want to impact your children? You want to prepare them? What is relationship? Relationship, the closer the relationship, the greater the influence. You know, Jesus understood this principle. According to Jesus, in Mark 3, 14, he appointed the 12 so that they could be with him. Jesus knew relationship is crucial. He appointed 12 disciples. No, it's not 100. Not 200. Just 12. In CCF, I have my own disciples. I have a business group. I have a pastoral group. But I break them down into a small group. Why? I want to spend time with them. You need to spend time with your children. Look, the Bible is very clear. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Do not be deceived. Sorry, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. So, how's your relationship with your children? Your children, do they like to spend time with you? You know, biological relationship does not guarantee good relationship. There's no guarantee. The power of influence is proportionate to the closeness of the relationship. The closer children are to their parents, the less they are influenced. Remember our speaker, he talks about everybody wants to belong. If you don't provide that belongness in your family, I guarantee you, your children will gravitate to their friends. Let me repeat. If your children do not have a clear sense of closeness to you, parents, they will look for relationship in their friends. And you have lost your influence. That is why teenage years are most crucial. Because when they are still young, you can shout at them, you can tell them what to do, they obey you. But once they become teenagers, they will rebel against you. And that's why many teenagers don't spend time with their parents. They don't enjoy spending time with parents. Why? Because you don't know how to build a relationship. I'm going to teach you how to do it. If you keep lecturing, lecture, lecture, your children will not like to spend time with you. How do you like to spend time with people? Every time you're together, your friend is lecturing you. 
You like that kind of friend? Or do you like just to hang around? Let's talk. Nice friendship. Yes or no? Alright. When did your children fall in love with you? You better answer that question. When did your child fall in love with you? If you do not have their hearts, you will not have their minds. So all of you, you need to win the hearts of your children. I want you to hear a video of my son. My son is now the CEO. He, he's running our company. He's also a pastor, okay? but he's running our company. So let's hear Paul. You know, yesterday my daughter asked me, Dad, are you going to work from home again? And I said, yes, I am. She said, great, yes. And I asked her, oh, why, why did you ask? And do you like it when I work at home? She said, yes, I love it. Just her wanting me to be at home, um, it, it really opens up the doors for an intimate relationship. If you want to build intimate relationships with your disciples, or with parents, or with your children, just want to be with them. And that's what I felt growing up. I knew my parents wanted to be with me. And even today, they're like, oh, you know, um, we wish we could be with the favorite people in our lives. Um, and they say that constantly. And so affirming that you want to be with the people you want to develop intimacy with means so much to them. And the second element is, is really cultivating uh, an environment of trust. And I, I felt that growing up. I could trust my parents with, with anything. It was their authenticity. You know, they, they were consistently joyful. I didn't have to guess, is that and mom going to be in a good mood today? They were consistent, and they were consistent as human beings. They were consistently following Christ at the pulpit, at the office, at home. They were the same person. And so when I struggled with pornography, I could tell my dad, and I could tell my mom. And they really helped me through that journey. They brought the computers out to the living room so that um, you know everybody could see what you were looking at. And so you know, both of us coming from um, great families, um, you would think that we would be great parents. And, and <laughs> we, we were at a parenting uh, or a family retreat, and the exercise was to ask your children, um, how have we hurt you? And in my mind, I was like, oh, easy answer. Um, we haven't hurt our kids. So I asked our kids, we were at the table, and I remember vividly, I said, how has daddy hurt you? And to my shock, all of them started to cry. And each of them had a specific example of how I had hurt them. And that's a great question to, to ask your children, your parents, your disciples. How have I hurt you? And as they share with you and open up, listen to them, which is what we did. And then we apologize. I apologize. I had hurt them more than Jenny had. And, um, you know, that's what God does when you come before Him with humility and the power of His Holy Spirit. He, he opens the doors to rebuild intimacy. You know, Jesus is the one that modeled intimacy uh, for us, right? He broke down all the barriers when He died on the cross to pay for our sin. And because of what He's done in my life, I realize it's important for you and I to constantly reach out to people. And when you express interest in people's lives, and create an environment of trust that develops into the sea. So, how is your relationship with your children? Here are the questions. How is your relationship with your children? Do they open up to you? Do they enjoy spending time with you? Do you know who are the influencers of your children? Do you know their best friends? How and who do they spend time with? Okay. Do you really know your children? Or are you going to be like Eli, who does not know that his children are no longer walking with God? So my advice is this. Develop a relationship with your children. Learn to win their hearts. Up to today, I'm still courting all of my children. Up to today, I'm courting all of my grandchildren. I don't spoil them. But I want to win their hearts. Because no relationship, no influence. Let me repeat. If you want to influence people, you need relationship. Rules without relationship will lead to rebellion. Discipline. Without relationships, we lead to resentment.
teaching values without relationship, you know, will lead to what? Rejection. I'm going to ask my wife to come to share with us how to build relationship, okay? So she's going to share with you how you build relationship. Let's welcome my wonderful wife. It's such a joy to be here with all of you and um, to share the principles that God has taught us and we've tried to apply in the lives of our children. So, to build relationships, you have to be very intentional. That's why it's called intentionality. And the first thing I want to share with you is affirmation. I'm sure you know this verse. The Bible says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. And sometimes we're so careless with what we say. That's why also God says in Ephesians chapter 4, let no unwholesome words proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as will, you know, build the poor of the person up according to the needs of the moment. So, um, I don't know about you, but how many of you are more prone to lecture than to listen? Le lecture more than listen with your children. You know, um, so, I'm going to share a verse with you. This is actually a command that we forget about. Let's read it together. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3. But I encourage, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, so that none of us, you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. What's the command here? Encourage one another. How often? Day after day. Are you doing that in your family, with your spouse, with your children? There has to be an intentionality, you know. We often correct, 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 because we think that's how we're going to make them better. But do you know that affirmation is so much more motivational than correction? And uh, one of the things we need to do is to develop a detective eyes in order to see how our children are growing in Christ-like character. Now, when you see it, you need to affirm it. Our problem is we want to wait for perfection before we affirm it. No, you have to continue to affirm progress. Say it with me. Affirm progress. And, um, and when you do, uh, affirmation is not just with words, but it's also with affection. You know, when you hug or you touch your child appropriately, it really tells them, I love you and everything is okay with us. Do you know that so many Asian kids tell me that their parents have never hugged them, have never affirmed them, and it's so, it's so much of an Asian culture, so we need to reverse that. We need to be able to affirm our children. Uh, day after day, and when you do that, their hearts soften, and your heart soften, and they're more, more motivated to become all that God created them to be. So look for their gifts, abilities, affirm it, affirm progress, and then when you have to correct them, you can do it in an affirming way. Did you know that? It's called the sandwich approach. How many are familiar with the sandwich approach? Okay, now I'm going to teach you something new. How many of you like to eat a sandwich? We have sandwiches there. It's, it's delicious, right? Chin ho cha, Chinese. Our masala in Tagalog. Okay, okay. How I don't know what is that. Okay, so one day I'm sitting with my son Peter Jr. We're having lunch. He was younger, and I thought, great. And you know, we're having a great time laughing. And then I thought, great time to correct him. And so I started to correct him. And, you know, I noticed as I was correcting him, my son was slouching in his chair more and more. He was slouching down, and suddenly his chin was on the table. And when I finished, he said, Mom, I'm no good. I'm going to amount to nothing. And I thought to myself, oh, no, it's lunchtime, and I forgot the sandwich. So what's the sandwich approach? I said, son, I am so sorry. You know what? This is a sandwich. Positive comment and then you make the correction, and then you make another positive comment. And so I said to him, son, I'm so sorry. I've really seen you mature and grow in this in so many areas, but this is just one area of your life where you can continue to improve. And I shared it with him, and then I ended with, you know, son, I'm sure that you will begin, you will continue to improve, you will continue to improve, because you want to become all that God wants you to be. Can I tell you, I literally saw my son Peter Jr. sit up in his chair and he gave a big smile and said, Hey mom, thanks, I can do that. So, when you correct, do it with a sandwich, okay? Say that with me. Sandwich. Positive, correction, positive. You see, because what you want to do is not 
tear them down. You have to build them up to Christ likeness, okay? So next one is open communication. Communication. What is open communication? You have to be intentional about this. So open communication means that your child feels safe to talk to you about anything without being rejected, shouted at, or, you know, corrected harshly. Let me ask you, do you have open communication in your family? So open communication means that when they share something that you don't like to hear, you, you're thinking, what? You don't go, what? You ask more questions to draw them out. So you interact, you don't react. Because when you react, it slams the door in open communication. So, example. Um, maybe you'll hear this in the video. Is Carolyn's video going to be, Candy, going to be shown? Okay. So, uh, I'll tell another story. My daughter, Joy, came home from college. So, by the way, all of our children went to local colleges, Ateneo. Why? Because we wanted to continue discipling them in their college years. And you know what? We told them, when you go, when you, you can go abroad for your master's degree. And which they, some of them did. Okay, so anyway, one day my daughter Joy came home. Mom, you know my friends, she's a soccer player. They said, why are you so against drugs? Why don't you try drugs, Joy, before you get so negative about it? So I'm, you know, I want to go, what? Drugs are bad. Don't do that. But I didn't. I took a deep breath. I said, Holy Spirit, take control of me. And then I said, so Joy, um, well, why are you saying that? You know, uh, what do you think about it? And so she said, well, you know, maybe I can understand people that are on drugs, and et cetera, et cetera. And then I shared, so I listened, asked more questions. And then the next thing you could do, ask questions, and then you can also share stories from your own life. So I said, you know, when I was younger, I had a Christian coffee shop for drug addicts. And actually, I thought maybe I should try drugs. And, um, and my friend who had been into drugs says, don't do that, Diana. You're going to be opening a door that's going to be hard to close later on. And so I told her that, and then I said, oh, by the way, I was just reading an article about drugs and how it affected this one person, and it got into, from marijuana to hard drugs. I said, would you like to read it? So that's the next thing. Be objective, not subjective. Share some objective articles, research. And she said, okay, I'll read it. After that, she came back, mom, this is the best article. I'm going to give it to all my friends, and I'm going to tell them this is why I'm not taking drugs. So open communication. I'll share one more. My daughter, Candy, which she's going to be talking about, uh, came to me and said, I think maybe am I lesbian? Do I have lesbian tendencies? She asked me. And so you'll hear her story here, but I will tell you what I did. I didn't go, what? That's wrong. The Bible says it's a sin. I listened. I asked questions. And then I told my own story that when I was younger, I had the same question. And what I did, I said, you know, when I talked to God about it, God talked to me about it. And God said, you know, Diana, I only created two genders. By the way, side comment, they've done a research on 500,000 people who gave their genes there is no gay gene. The, guy, the les, uh, LGBTQ has lied to us and convinced us it's genetic. It's not. So if you have children that are gay, you know, confused, gender confused, do not encourage them by saying, okay, well then change your body, dress like a boy. If you're a girl, you can be like a boy. No. You have to help them recalibrate their brain back to what God has created them to be. So I said, Candy, this is what God told me. Diana, I created only two genes, male and female. And the, dis the question is not, are you gay inclined? Are you lesbian inclined? But will you follow my design? God told me, that's the question. And I said, you know, Candy, I thought, well, that's a, yes, okay, Lord, I will follow your design. I will make that choice. And I said, because I did that, you see, I met your wonderful father. I'm in love with him now. And we have all these children, and you're here. You know what? That day she was crying. Mom, if I couldn't talk to you, who could I talk to? And she decided to follow God's design. And today she's married with four kids. So open communication is so important. And the last one, and time is running out. My husband's standing up. Hi, honey. Okay, time. <laughs> time. Time is so important. For children, love is spelled T-I-M-E. Did you know that? 
Now, as parents, we're so busy and we think, oh, well, my kids are okay. But no, your kids are not okay. You have to be intentional in carving out time, regular basis for your children. Story. Peter was busy. He was a businessman. He was studying. And he was also a ministry. He had so many bags he carried. But you know what? Every night he came home for dinner. And we had dinner together. And if it was late, I told the children, wait, it's more important you have time with dad than to eat early. I'd give him something, but we would wait for him. And at night, he came home. He came home Holy Spirit controlled temperament. He never came home, I'm tired, leave me alone. He never came home in a bad mood. By the way, bad moods are selfishness because you're not thinking about anybody else. So he came home filled with the spirit, filled of joy. We had dinner together, no telephone at the table, no cell phone. We didn't have cell phones there, no telephone, uh, because he's present. So you need time, you need to be present with your children, you have to let them know they're the most important people in your life. And we had discipleship time at the table. And when you have time, you will have magic moments. This is when they're going to open up and bear their heart to you. And if you understand open communication, those will be really magic moments. And so, I know without farther ado, we will show a video. Okay? You understand? What is it? How are you intentional? A-C-T. Say it with me. Affirmation, communication, and time. Video, please. You know, my parents created an environment where we could share and talk about anything. And it was because they really listened to us. They created environments where we could talk. We had family dinners almost every night as a family, talking about big issues. And I always felt like my parents were there if I ever needed anything. If my dad was in a meeting and I called, he would always answer. Or if I needed to talk to my mom, she would listen and focus and pay attention. And I remember growing up, um, my parents talking to us about you know, even sexual issues, um, drinking, um, identity. One of the things I struggled with that I was really ashamed at one point to talk about was um, my fear of becoming a lesbian someday. And I played sports, I was in basketball, volleyball, and um, there were lesbians around me. And, you know, some would even hit on me. And I remember having this fear and feeling like, oh no, what if? If I become one someday and I went to my mom with it and shared with her and she told me something that surprised me she can't get with the same thing and I realized that her sharing from her own life and her own experiences really broke down the barrier and made a difference and made me feel comfortable and I told her mom if I didn't go to you with this who would I go to if I can't go to my parents with the deepest things in my heart um, that, you know, we can go to friends, but sometimes their advice is not going to be as good as our parents who love us and are, you know, walking with the Lord. Before Jeff and I got together, I was dating another guy, and I had always committed to only marrying someone that my dad and my mom approved of. So, um, I called my dad and said, hey, there's this guy I want you to meet. And so my parents, because they cared and loved me very much, they flew to the States, and they met this other guy, and it wasn't long when they said, Candy, I don't think he's God's best for you. And because we had that open communication already and established that in my younger years, you know, I really believed them and I trusted them. And I um, was able to receive them telling me pretty much to break it up. And even though it was difficult, I listened. And by God's grace, I met Mr. Wonderful. And um, I couldn't be happier in our marriage. And I, I just know that it's because of the open communication and also God's protection that he led me to Jeff. And we have four wonderful kids. Now that I'm an adult, and you know, even with my parents, when they visit, they still ask us how can they improve. And we ask them how we can improve. And one time my dad was visiting. And um, he was in here in the States, and I felt like he was being a little selfish and not helping. And because we had an open lines of communication, I was able to tell him, hey, Dad, I feel like sometimes you're selfish and you don't think about others. And it was hard for me to say that, but I knew that he would, he would be able to receive it because we developed that relationship over the years. And by God's grace, he was humble, and he's really trying to change. And I've seen a difference even from that conversation also. Dad, you're amazing. You still keep growing and improving, and I appreciate you and Mom very much. I love you. Praise God. These are the uh, examples of what you need for a relationship with your children. 
so that you can impact their lives. Now, if you have problems right now with adult children, they are adults already. You don't have good relationships. I want you to practice first with your husband and wife, right? Today, you and your wife. Has, gentlemen, is your wife here today? You guys, where, where is your wife? <laughs> ah, so, in Faith Academy, they don't allow you to sit. Okay. Whoever is the organizer, I suggest next time you get husband and wife to always sit together, okay? So that we can... Okay, but I usually do this, but because of time, we cannot do this, but I force every couple every family to ask three questions. Alright? Guys, if you know something is wrong with your relationship, with your children, it's easy. You know something is wrong. It's called wounded spirit. They withdraw. They become silent. If your wife becomes silent, your wife doesn't talk to you. They avoid you. They become critical. You know something is wrong with your children. Yes or no? So what do you do? Question number one, everybody asks, how can I improve? The moment you ask that, you keep quiet. Don't defend, don't explain. Example, today, you are seated with your husband. You ask, how can I improve? And then you give suggestions. One or two suggestions. Everybody, you do that. It's amazing. Next question, a bit harder. How have I heard of it? Oh my goodness. I was just like my son. I thought everything is okay. And then we began. Remember, we have pastors, every table. Well, we got a big convention hall. And all the pastors with their family, every family, every family. Man, they spent a little time with my wife only, but with me a long time. This is how you have heard us. One, two. So, what's the rule? What's the rule? Listen and don't react. Just listen. See how things. Don't defend. Look at me, gentlemen. When they tell you how you hurt them, what do you do? Don't talk. Just listen. Just listen. You're Thank you. Thank you. Okay? So, do that today. With your children, with your wife. Last. Intentionality. How do you disciple your children? M is modeling, R is what? Build relationships. And lastly, you have to be intentional. What do, I, what do we mean by being intentional? Intentionality simply means it's not by accident. Good results seldom happen by chance. You have to be intentional. The Bible is very clear. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. You know, I'm shocked at many people, they don't understand the meaning of the word train. The Bible does not say teach. The Bible says train up a child. The Bible says a child. Begin young. Train. The word train comes from the Hebrew word chana. It has two important meanings. The first meaning is used to describe whetting the appetite of a baby. You put your forefinger on dates and put it on the Pirate of a baby so the baby would like to suck. So you create a sucking desire. Meaning of the word train. The second meaning of the word train is to train a wild horse. A wild horse is useless until you break the will of the horse without breaking the spirit. Let me repeat. Every child has a will. How many of you have children, my friends? I hope all of you are. That's why you're here, right? You don't have children? You may hide them. Jesus. You know this? Even one, two, three years old, they are defiant. They, they say, no, no, no. Yes or no? Every child is like a wild horse. So you've got to train them. My wife and I, in, in the book that I uh, hope you, you get a copy, we teach them three important words. And they're still young. How do you deal with two, three years old? How do you deal with four, five, six, seven, eight years old? How do you deal with teenagers? We put that in the book. But for for children, you teach them.
Number one, the word wait. Say that with me. Wait. Together. Wait. Teach your children to wait. Number two, teach your children to say no. Say that with me. No. And lastly, obey. Three magic words. First, wait. We will purposely let our children wait. You know, for children, to wait for two minutes is like eternity. We will purposely train. You want cookie? Wait. Next? No. But they keep trying. Okay, talk to mommy. And then mommy, talk about daddy. You see, they convince you to say yes. No, no. Learn to say no. No is what? <coughs> Lastly, obey. So, in our book, we want to share with you, we teach our children how to deal with the world, the power of friends, we teach them how to choose friends, we teach them who they are, identity is crucial, because if they don't know who they are in Christ, not Chinese, Americans, or what, who are you in Christ? You've got to find your security in Christ. If not, they will have a problem. Marriage, we teach them marriage. I've seen many, many nice people mess up, they marry the wrong person. So you better teach them early. Did you notice her testimony? Five of them, my wife and I all play important role. Because they will never give their heart without our approval. We made a deal. We made an arrangement, private. Before they say yes to their boyfriend, girlfriend, they want us to say yes. You better teach them early. If not, in a way to talk. You will have a headache. Finance, we teach them finance. <coughs> Many parents don't teach their children how to deal with money. You need to teach them. This is most important. Why do you believe what you believe? We teach our children not just what to believe. Why do you believe the Bible? Why do you believe in Jesus? Until you can teach them why, you have a problem. Because today, young people, when they go to college, the first thing they learn, no absolute truth. Today, when you go to college, even in the Philippines, they teach you no absolute truth. So how do you teach them? You need to study. You need to know. Okay? This is so crucial. That's where many parents fail. You don't teach your children why they believe what they believe. I teach our children the Bible. Why do we believe the Bible? Okay. We have all of those materials. We will be happy to share that with you. And then we teach them who God is. Okay? Alright. So, you will think this is simple. It's not. That's why I said this seminar takes time. Sometimes it's two, three days seminar. Okay? But Fail Khan is very smart, so. <laughs> you say one hour, we're done. No, no problem. Alright. So, as we close, I want you to realize something. If ever I want to share with you one thing to be intentional, you cast vision. You cast vision to your children. You know why? Without vision, yeah, vision inspires. The greater the vision, the greater the motivation. Do you ever tell your children what they can become in Christ? You got to cast vision. Your children are all amazing people. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Let's read this together. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Many people don't understand the word, we are His workmanship. That word workmanship has the idea of masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. That's from the word poema. Poem. Masterpiece. Masterpiece means no duplicate. Your children are unique. They are special. Can you tell each other? Tell each other. You are special. You are really special. Now, does your children feel special when you talk to them? You got to tell your children they are special. God has an amazing plan for them. I cast vision to all of my five children based on God. 
You see, they are special because of Jesus, amen? Because of me. We are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece in Christ Jesus. For good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, how do you cast vision? Let's hear a video of my son. He's my elder son. In Proverbs 29, 18, Solomon says wisely, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. And that was me. Sure, on the outside I seemed okay. You know, I didn't get into drugs. I, I, I didn't uh, get drunk and get into fights. But on the inside, where only God knows what's going on, I was unrestrained. But there's always hope in God. And I want to share three stories, three short stories of how God used my parents to recast vision into my lives. The first was when I was young and already working. I had a good job, but I was always looking forward to the next game. And that's what I did for. And my dad challenged me to get an MBA. It was hard to apply for an MBA. He, he led me to mentors who would guide me. So I had to put down gaming. But as a result of that challenge, I got into one of the best programs in the world. And it, you know, my dad was instrumental in giving me a vision for something more than just working every day and having fun gaming. Second story, I had already finished my MBA and I was working in a good job in a multinational in the United States. My parents visited me and they challenged me beyond just working. They asked me, you know, is there anyone you're interested in? At this point in time, my brother was already married and my sister. And I was the bachelor who was just living in New York City. And you know, when they challenged me, I started to think about it. And I remember praying every day after that. Lord, will you guide me in this area? And somehow one night, I met my wife at a church as I was serving God. So my last story, as, as we wrap up, is we already have a daughter. We're, we're parents in the city. And my heart, you know, again, I started to play a lot of games because I enjoy it. And my dad and mom visited, and they, they challenged me again. They asked, you know, um, what else are you going to do with your life? Do you see yourself serving God? And so they, they asked questions that made me think and, and opened my heart to eventually um, moving here because we can serve God more here. Stay awakened in our hearts a passion to do something for the Lord, for the one who made us. So now that we have uh, our children, I'm trying to cast vision into their lives and I'm realizing it's actually really hard but I remember something my parents did for us while we were growing up. It has to do with our identity. God didn't cast a vision from heaven by just sending us some words on a piece of paper. God came down in the form of Jesus Christ to model, to have open communication with us, to spend time with us and build intimacy so that we can have the greatest vision of our lives. We were made to glorify Him. And we will never truly be happy until we find our happiness in the God that we glorify Him. So thank you, Lord. And to God be all the glory. My friend, all of you will pass on a legacy. What is legacy? What do you pass on to the next generation? Many Chinese, they like to pass on money, am I correct? They like to pass on business, yes? But I suggest you pass on something that is lasting. You will all leave something behind. So what do you pass on? Well, let me tell you, whether you like it or not, you will pass on a legacy. Let me repeat. Whether you like it or not, you will pass on a legacy. My question is, what kind of legacy? What will they remember you for? And what will they pass on based on what you have passed on to them? Somebody once said, when you leave, exit in this life, when you get out of the corridor of life and you enter into eternity, you ask yourself, what do you leave behind? May I give you two examples of families? One, both of them live in New York City. 
I work in New York City for, for a short time. It's a great city. But this is the legacy. Max Jukes. This guy does not love the Lord. He's not a Christian. He does not believe in going to church. So this is his legacy. This guy researched, okay? Up to four or five generations. And this is the legacy of Max Jukes. Seven murders. 60 thieves. 130 convicts. 100 drunkards. 300 paupers. 400 physically wrecked by indulgent living. Half of female descendants as prostitutes. Another family, Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards. He was a godly man. He's a man of God. He teaches the Bible. But he has 11 children. These 11 children, he made sure he spent time with them. Every day, he, he allocates one hour for all of their children. He is very intentional. Now, would you like to know what happened to his legacy? Okay, this is the legacy of Jonathan Edwards. 13 college presidents. 65 college professors. 100 lawyers. 30 judges. 65 doctors. 3 U.S. senators. 3 state governors. 3 mayors of large cities. 1 vice president of the U.S.A. 100 missionaries. Leaders in banking, commerce, and industry. What made Jonathan different? He was very intentional. People don't realize it. when he was only 20 years old, he made the following resolution. Resolution number one, I will live for God. Resolution number two, if no one else does, I will still live for God. Resolution number three, resolve never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if there were the last hour of my life. Friends, you have to be intentional. Okay? So how do you influence your children? Number one, mother. Say that with me. So today your assignment, what should you stop doing? Are you always shouting at home? Are you disrespectful? What should you stop? What should you stop? Principle number two. Mo, what am ah, what's I? I? I want you guys to have fun time with your children. Have good time with your children. Build relationships. You know, I take my children out on vacation. I don't bring their cousins. Just them alone. You know why? For a relationship. Ask yourself, how's your relationship? If your answer is not good, it's never too late. Remember the three questions you, you got to ask your children? How can I improve? Number two, how have I hurt you? Just listen. I guarantee you, they will cry. And you will cry. This is the most powerful practices I can give to any leaders. Ask those three important questions. How can I improve? Keep quiet. Number two, how have I hurt you? Number three, will you forgive me? And lastly, 